Hey, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here, and I'm really honored. This is my first trip to Edinburgh, uh, my first honorary degree, which I'm receiving tomorrow, on my birthday. So July 4th is my birthday, which in America I get fireworks every year, but actually <laughs> coming for an honorary degree is even better than fireworks. So uh, thanks, John, for organizing this and, and, and for allowing me to give a technical talk as well. Uh, feel free to ask me questions as I go along. And uh, this is actually about some very new work that I'm doing. We've been doing it for about the last year. We, of course, means the postdoc, Nariman Farsad, who gets all the credit for everything that I'm going to talk about. That's the great thing about being a professor is that your students and postdocs do all the work, as you all know, the students and postdocs out there, and then we get to stand up here and present it. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about where this work came from because uh, for people that know me and the work that I do, I'm not a bandwagon person. If somebody's doing, you know, if there's a topic that's really hot like machine learning and everybody's jumping into it, I run away as fast as I can because it's very hard to create new results when there's so many people working in a field. So my paradigm in research has generally been find something that people aren't working in that much, which was true of wireless when I started, get some early results and then get out. And, uh, and, and so certainly working in machine learning is, is the opposite of my usual paradigm. And the way we came to it was the fact that we were doing a molecular communication system design. And molecular uh, communications, here in the you know, foundation of where Maxwell did all his work, doesn't follow standard propagation by Maxwell's equations because it's not electromagnetic. It actually follows a diffusion process. And so you can apply traditional channel models to do things like equalization. So that's how we got into machine learning. And once we started looking at machine learning for this particular problem of molecular communications, we realized there was a lot more potential. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Now, uh, when I uh, first thought about the title for this talk, I mean, you know, we do communication system theory. And so, you know, can, can machine learning trump theory? But then, you know, in politics today, that's really not the word I want to use or give, give the connotation <laughs> associated with my current president. So let's just say we're going to talk about whether machine learning can beat theory and how it might beat theory in, in this kind of design. OK, so before I get into the details of the talk, I just want to give a, a, a kind of a broader overview of where does machine learning and communication system design fit into the broader picture? Um, I've actually been working in uh, wireless communication since the mid-80s, so 30 years. I like to think I look younger than that, but that is how long I've been working in wireless. And it's, uh, it was very exciting when I went back to graduate school in 1989. We were just moving from first generation systems to second generation systems, 1G to 2G, analog to digital. And, and so it was a very exciting time to do communications. And when students, undergraduates and you know, early graduate students talk to me now, they say, well, you know, haven't we done everything? Is there anything more to do in communication theory? Why are you still working in that field? And, and I actually think it's the most exciting time in the 30 years that I've been in communications to be working in this field because there's so many new paradigms that we haven't thought about before. And as a graduate student or as a researcher, that means that you can kind of ignore a lot of the research that's been done in certain areas because there's a, a clean slate. And what do I mean by that? Well, what's new is uh, up until now, previous generations of wireless from 1G on for both cellular and Wi-Fi and other systems were initially about people talking to each other. So that's what cellular first generation and second generation cellular were or people accessing information from the internet. And now we're starting to see a lot of this device-to-device -device communication, which is not only enabling new paradigms, but the design um, principles that we used as we've been building future generations of wireless have mostly been about, can we get to higher data rates? Really, data rate is what has driven every evolution of wireless since it went digital. And now that we're looking at this Internet of Things where every single device has a radio and sends information up to the cloud for cloud processing, um, data rate is no longer the most important thing. Often it's energy consumption, often it's reliability or minimal latency if you're trying to do some kind of real-time control. And so what I meant about all those papers that people have written, including me in the past, is that if we were only focused on increasing data rates, that's no longer the design paradigm. And therefore, we need to think differently about how we design systems, and that opens up a whole wealth of new research problems. So I think it's a super exciting time to be doing wireless communication. 
Uh, part of the challenge is the fact that we don't have a lot of spectrum. So this chart is taken from the FCC, uh, which is the governing body in the United States that controls spectrum, but the same thing is true around the world, is that if you look, and this only goes up to 2014, um, what's driven the growth in demand for wireless data is mostly video, and we've seen d demand for wireless data go up exponentially. If you look at uh, 2013, which is around the time that this report came out, already in 2013, we were 90 megahertz in deficit in terms of being able to support the wireless system uh, data demands at the time. Now, uh, if that was 2013, five years ago, um, five years later, why are we able to get anything on our phones or on our laptops in terms of wireless data if we were in 90 megahertz of spectrum deficit? Now, this is for the licensed bands. So what this picture is missing is the unlicensed band. So basically, we in fact have 300 megahertz of spectrum in Wi-Fi bands in the, in the 5 gigahertz range. So the reason that the fact that we're in licensed spectrum deficit, 90 megahertz of the licensed spectrum is missing to support data on cellular service, hasn't destroyed the future of wireless data because we have Wi-Fi. So basically, when you want high-speed data, typically you don't use your cellular network, you switch to Wi-Fi if it's available. And then, of course, emerging, we have millimeter wave systems, which have even more spectrum, but challenges of their own. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our molecular communication system that we're building, which is very low data rates, but important in scenarios where you can't do electromagnetic wave propagation, for example, inside the body, because you might damage organs, or underwater, where electromagnetic waves don't travel very well, or on chips uh, and other electronic devices where you have a lot of interference from electronics. So there's all these new paradigms for communicating wirelessly, because molecular communication is wireless. It's just using a channel that isn't governed by electromagnetic waves. Um, so we have new design paradigms to help us get out of this spectrum deficit. And the ones that are most important there really are the millimeter wave band. And we do research in that that I'm not going to talk about, but, um, but there's a lot of interesting challenges there. So other wireless challenges beyond just the fact that we don't have a lot of available spectrum that's good spectrum to communicate over uh, is the Internet of Things. So I already mentioned the energy constraints. Um, also networking. So when you're talking about having billions of devices, how do we network those together? How do we allow access to the channel for so many more devices than we have now? And how do we do this in, in nanoscale environments where things are very, very tiny? Um, Another interesting challenge is how do you go between different networks? So if I'm on my cell phone, I don't really care if I'm talking to the cellular tower or a Wi-Fi base station or a millimeter wave base station. I just want things to work. And yet the way the backbone network of Wi-Fi uh, wi and cellular and millimeter wave, they're completely separate networks, which makes it very difficult to hand off between them. And that creates other problems in terms of supporting um, applications that have latency constraints. Okay, so how do we get to higher data rates? If I just want to focus on what's the next generation of wireless that's going to enable us to have gigabit per second data rates, Li-Fi may solve some of those problems. Where's Harold? I want to make sure. Li-Fi is good. I don't see him. He must be somewhere. He's hiding back there. But, you know, but there's still a place for wireless. It's not going to be completely displaced by light. Uh, so we can get to these higher data rates by using more spectrum in the millimeter wave bands, using massive MIMO, where every time you add an uh, antenna at the transmitter and receiver, you get an uh, increase in data rates. We can rethink cellular system design. Uh, in fact, and I have a whole talk on every one of these bullet items, uh, Cellular systems are designed today, the overall architecture, the same way they were designed. Anyone know when the first cellular paper, the paper on uh, the idea of using cellular communication systems came out? Yeah, you know. 1947. Yeah, right. So uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I thought it was 1950 by McDonald, right? But no, no. from the Bell Labs, Bell Labs that's right. That's right, Dr. Ring, exactly, 1947. Okay, so, so the notion of cellular has been around a long time. And that paper by Ring uh, 
uh, talks about frequency reuse. It talks about basic. It basically defines the way we build cellular systems today. And I would argue that we really haven't evolved in our thinking of building cellular systems much in terms of the overall architecture from that paper from 1947. We don't take advantage of all of the signal processing techniques that we have, the multi-user detection techniques that we have, the MIMO. We do at the physical layer, but not in the overall architecture of the system. So there's a lot to do in terms of thinking about um, changing cellular system design, uh, using what I call software-defined wireless networking, where all of, basically, you, you don't have a notion of base stations or, or access points anymore. You just put dumb antennas out there and do all the processing uh, in the cloud, which is like cloud RAN, except you can do it more intelligently in terms of how you do resource allocation, not do everything centralized. So again, I'm not going to talk about, the only thing I'm going to talk about um, in terms of these new techniques is what about new physical layer techniques, okay? So, but, you know, new physical layer techniques, we've been working on the physical layer of wireless for a long time. And uh, again, I've been doing research in wireless for 30 years. So there's been a number of iterations of saying, well, physical layer research is dead. The first one was 1971. I wasn't doing research back then, but I heard about this, okay? Uh, so in 1971 is basically the, the, it's called the coding is dead com theory workshop where um, I believe it was uh, Bob McLeese got up and said, yes, it was Bob McLeese got up and said coding theory is dead. And, uh, in fact, Erwin Jacobs was in the audience and he stood up and he said, it's not dead because if he pulls out of his pocket an integrated circuit, which is basically saying the reason coding theory was dead was because we didn't have the hardware to build encoders and decoders that could manage the complexity of the codes at the time. And the integrated circuit in 1971 was just starting to really take off. And that is in fact what made coding theory including the codes that we use today, possible. So um, it wasn't dead in 1971, even though people thought it was. But then the next iteration came uh, when I was a graduate student. So just before I was a graduate student. So the 1980s, uh, I got my undergraduate degree in 1986. And all the people in Bell Labs that had been working in, in wireless communication were moved to optical fiber because McKinsey, which is a big consulting company in the United States, told AT&T there won't be any market for cellular. You know, it's too expensive. Nobody's going to want to buy this big receiver. Um, so they moved everybody out of wireless communication. So there was a thought process in the early 80s that, you know, we've done everything we can do in the, in the physical layer. So what happened to change that? What happened in the 80s? You can't say. <laughs> you know too much. <laughs> Anyone know? That's when the first cellular systems were rolled out. So the mid-80s, the first analog cellular system was rolled out in Chicago. And it actually, the consultants were wrong. It was a huge hit. People really wanted to do cellular. It ignited in the late 80s the race to standardize the second generation of cellular systems, which is when I became a graduate student. And all of a sudden, all the problems in the world were open. How do we design a digital cellular system? And Wi-Fi was also starting to take off. In fact, the early Wi-Fi systems were in the late 80s. They were not standardized, so they were not successful. 802.11b came around. Uh, actually, A preceded B, even though it was never built out, in the early 1990s. So that's when Wi-Fi started to take off. So when I was, you know, I was lucky enough as a graduate student an early professor that, you know, everybody was super excited about wireless, which is a great time to be an assistant professor because you're going to get money and tenure and all that stuff. So I was very lucky to, to, to realize or to fall in love with wireless at that time frame. So it, as the late 80s and early 90s came along, of course, wireless was, was all the rage. Now, we've been doing a lot of work, you know, for 20 years on, on evolving wireless. And so now, you know, these days in 2014, there was a paper published in the, in the Com uh, magazine uh, saying, is the phi layer dead? So again, we're talking about it being dead, but I don't think it's dead. I think even just for the physical layer, there's a lot of interesting work still to be done. So what's new um, in phi layer? Machine learning is one thing, which is the topic of this talk, but also other innovations. So just briefly, I I'm actually uh, on the advisory board of a company called Cohere which we saw in the Maxwell Foundation this morning, the Coherer receiver from the early 1900s. They're building a whole company around a new physical layer technique, which is basically uh, taking the time frequency uh, basis that we usually do our design of communication system in, moving it to the delay Doppler basis, because by doing that, you actually have a very stable 
physical layer. So it's very good for things like high-speed trains or very dense modulations where small changes in the environment don't cause any change in the physical layer because you're designing it in a basis that isn't time frequency dependent. So there's interesting things to look at new waveforms, new detection techniques, obviously, especially for uh, if you think about these Internet of Things devices that are very small, very constrained in terms of energy consumption, um, you can uh, not go to the very high, or you don't have the option of going to the very high complexity techniques that we used. And then there's also new things that we can do with respect to coding and decoding. And so I'm going to talk about, uh, in this talk, the new technique of applying uh, machine learning for physical layer design. So what, um, what do I mean? Uh, so, th so this is basically what I'm going to talk about. Why do we even want to look at machine learning? Are we just jumping on the bandwagon and saying communication theorists can also use machine learning? Or is there something new that we bring to the table as communication theorists in implying uh, machine learning? Then I'm going to talk about uh, using machine learning for signal detection, both uh, when you know the channel model but you don't have uh, the parameters perfectly estimated, like in any time varying channel, or when you have no channel model at all. And that's where machine learning is powerful because there's nothing to compare it against. We have no way of doing signal detection using traditional techniques if we don't have a channel model. Perturbing detection is based on knowing the channel model. Uh, all of the linear, lower complexity techniques for detection also assume you have a channel model. So how do you do detection when you don't have a channel model? Machine learning is perfect for that. And then I'll also talk about uh, joint source and channel coding of text. I've done a lot of work in joint source and channel coding, uh, but never using machine learning techniques, using more traditional compression and then uh, channel coding techniques. And it turns out that for the same reason that machine learning is very powerful in uh, text recognition and speech recognition, it's also very powerful in joint source and channel coding of uh, text. Okay, so why machine learning? Well, obviously, I'm sure you all know, machine learning has been very successful. It's been applied to a million different things, and, and uh, the uh, citations and interest in machine learning has grown. Uh, some of this is hype. And again, those of us that have been around for a few decades, remember artificial intelligence used to be a bad word. Okay, I mean, there was a time when artificial intelligence was also super hyped, as hyped as machine learning. It was going to solve all engineering problems. We would all be out of work because we wouldn't need engineers anymore. We'd just apply artificial intelligence. Um, and it didn't pan out that way. So it, uh, the artificial intelligence of the 80s uh, was actually kind of a flop. It was not that successful in, um, in any of the promise that it was supposed to have. Now, that's not true for machine learning. So machine learning, you can think of it as an evolution of artificial intelligence. It's, it's far more sophisticated and powerful than the tools that we had in the 1980s. And we also have the computational uh, ability to use machine learning um, in its most complex manner. And so it has been very successful. So it's been successful in beating humans at chess. It's been successful in the DARPA Grand Challenge of having um, autonomous cars uh, driving through unknown environments. And it's been successful in the, in the Go system, which is more complex than chess. So, um, so basically, we've seen that machine learning, unlike the systems of the 1980s, actually has had a lot of success in places where other technologies uh, were unable to be that successful. And again, uh, not just these examples, there's a few other examples, in particular speech recognition and um, uh, voice recognition and, and text recognition. So where does this fit into physical layer design? Okay, so why would we look at machine learning and physical layer design? Uh, well, so if you look at a typical block diagram of a communication system, uh, the transmitter and the receiver are generally designed based on a known mathematical channel model. So if you think about, OK, I want to send 10 gigabit per second over an additive white Gaussian noise channel. OK, so I design my constellations. My receiver uh, is a match filter that's giving me the maximum signal to noise ratio over that channel. If the channel happens to be something that introduces intersymbol interference, then I can use multi-carrier modulation at the transmitter to mitigate the impact of the ISI. Or I can just do standard transmission uh, without any pre-equalization techniques and put a, a equalizer in the receiver, which is how we used to design these systems. Or I could make it a spread spectrum system, where I'm using spread spectrum to mitigate the effect of intersymbol interference. In all of these cases, I assume that H of F is a known channel. 
Okay, I can't do equalization or multi-carrier modulation uh, where I don't do something to compensate for the frequency selective fading unless I know what the frequency selective fading is, which means I know H of F. Okay, so um, what if I don't have an accurate model for H of F? So let's just take equalization as an example. The equalizer is essentially inverting H of F. So if I don't know H of F, I can't do equalization. Um, even if I know that the model follows a standard frequency selective fading channel, if I don't have all the parameters of the channel, then again, my equalizer will not be very effective. Um, so one reason why we might turn to machine learning is that we either don't have accurate channel models or we don't have any channel models. Another reason is that maybe we do have good channel models, but the technique that we're trying to employ, like equalization, is so complex that it's impractical and therefore I want to use some other technique. So these are reasons why uh, I might want to turn to something besides traditional techniques. And how does a machine learning approach solve this? Well, in machine learning, you actually don't need any underlying channel model at all. You don't, not only don't need the parameters, you don't even know what the channel is. And as I mentioned at the beginning, that's actually what brought us into machine learning, is that for a molecular communication channel, which is diffusion-based, there were no models. There's no mathematical model. There are approximations, but they weren't very good. They weren't good enough for standard techniques to work well. And so when there's no model or you don't know the parameters, you can learn the design directly from the data. So you don't even need to know how to design the transmitter or how to design the receiver. You just kind of throw machine learning algorithms at it. And if you do it in an intelligence way based on underlying knowledge of how these things are designed, you can actually come up with a very good receiver, which I'm going to show you the performance of. And now we're starting to look at, well, maybe the way we do encoding or maybe the way we do modulation should also be based on some kind of machine learning approach. Okay, so I'm going to talk about two applications of machine learning to communication system design. The first is detection, and the second is this joint source and channel coding. Okay, so why should we look at deep learning detectors? Um, Again, we don't necessarily have a channel model, so we can't, if we don't have a channel model, we can't rely on traditional detection techniques. Um, if the uh, channel model is completely unknown or difficult to characterize analytically, so that's what we ran up against in our molecular system, is that it's a diffusion-based model, so it's based on differential equations. So is Maxwell's equations, but we've had, you know, 100 years of reducing Maxwell's equations into fairly standard channel models, whereas we don't have that history in taking diffusion-based channel models and reducing them to mathematical equations. So now with deep learning detectors, we don't need to have a channel model. We can just learn how to detect the data by training up the machine learning algorithm. And I'll talk to you about how we do that uh, shortly. Um, the other thing we found in, in, again, in our molecular communication system is that the channel has a very long memory because the memory is based on how fast the molecules in the channel decompose or diffuse. Okay, it's not like intersymbol interference where once you have, you know, run out of enough reflectors that have strong reflections, there's no more ISI. In a molecular communication channel, in principle, some of the molecules, depending on what you're using, can stick around forever. So you have very long memory, and this allows you to do equalization without the complexity of a standard equalizer. The other uh, situation you may run into is that maybe you know that the channel follows a traditional frequency selective fading model, but um, it's too time consuming or costly, there's too much overhead associated with estimating the channel's uh, parameters, so we can apply deep learning there. And um, the last thing which we haven't explored yet is that the very nature of deep learning gives you soft um, uh, values in the detection that you can use in channel decoders, like in soft perturbing detection. So those are, that's the motivation for looking at deep learning for detectors. So how many people here are familiar with machine learning? Raise your hand. Okay, so about, about half, maybe a little less. So I'm going to do a quick overview. This is like neural networks. Uh, I won't say for dummies because I don't want to insult you, but neural networks for people that don't have a lot of background in them. The caveat is that I also don't have a lot of background in them. Nariman is the expert. So, you know, it's kind of like the blind leading the blind. So the people that raise their hand and know about neural networks, please feel free to correct me if I say anything wrong. But I just wanted to give you a brief overview of how these work so you can see how we're using them in this detection problem. So the basic idea, the underlying building block of a neural network is a neuron, an artificial neuron, which which is basically taking a vector as input into the neuron. It applies some weights to that vector, 
adds some constant b, and then applies a function phi to that weighted uh, sum of the weights times the input vector plus this constant. And the function that you use, the phi, there's all kinds of different phi's that you might use, and they've been used in different types of neural networks, and so part of the design of the neural network is which function to pick, and usually you use the same function for all the neurons. So that's how uh, the neuron in the neuron, neural network works. And then uh, a simple neural network builds up a bunch of layers of these neurons. So the input layer now is, so here I have my input and I have a bunch of neurons. So I have different vectors going into each one of these uh, neurons here. Then the output of those neurons are going to the neurons in the second layer. Output of those neurons are going to the third layer and so forth. So you can have a bunch of different layers. All of that feeds into the output layer where my output here now is going to be the output of a single neuron. So the output there, the, um, the Y that comes out, is, uh, is this uh, phi 1. So this is the uh, function applied to any one of the neurons in this picture of neurons. Okay, so, so that's how uh, the basic building block of a neural network works. And the most important aspect of this in terms of design is the weights. Okay, so I already said that the, each one of these neurons is applying a weight, W, to the input vector. So how do I figure out what weights I want? Well, basically, it's through training where you say, OK, I know what I'm trying to do. Maybe I'm trying to classify an image. Or maybe I'm trying to detect a signal that I sent through a channel with intersymbol interference. So how do we train equalizers uh, in the past? We would send a set of known symbols through the channel. And then that would tell us what the weights of the equalizer needed to be. Same idea here. So we say, OK, I'm trying to determine uh, something through this neural network. I'm trying to learn something, so I'm going to send test data, which may be, okay, is this a dog or not a dog? So that's my input vector. I, I optimize my weights to give me the output as, that's associated with my training data, and then I run the system on new data, okay? So the weights um, control this. So I have some input x that's my desired input. So in the context of a communication system, this could be a training sequence. I have a set of ones and zeros that I know this is the ones and zeros that I want to detect at the output. I run that through the neural network. So Y is the channel output assess associated with my test sequence. And then I run it through the neural network to get the weights that give me the output x hat that's closest to my original data sequence. So again, thinking about this in the context of a communication system, x would be my training sequence of ones and zeros. Y would be the output of the channel, which I may not have a model for. It's just telling me the output of the channel given this known sequence X of inputs. And then I go through optimizing the weights of the neural network, so the weights of every neuron, so that what I get at the output of the output layer is as close as possible to X. So that's how I'm optimizing the weights. Clear? Everybody understand where the weights come from. OK, so how do I get these weights? This is a standard optimization problem. So you can use gradient descent, which is one way to do optimization. You can use backpropagation, which is another way to do the optimization. So again, part of the art of neural network design is figuring out how to get the best weights. OK, so we'll just assume that we're using some standard technique to get the weights of this uh, neural network. Now, where does this come into the bigger picture of the communication system? Uh, so again, now the x's are my desired data sequence. So I have some information that I want to send. It goes through a source encoder to turn that data into ones and zeros. Then I may use some channel encoding to protect against errors in the channel. So my x's here are now what's going into the channel. That's my desired data. And my y is what I observe at the output of the channel. OK, after signal detection. So how do I do training? If I'm going to do this detection algorithm based on neural networks, I take the Ys that come out of the channel. First, I'm going to use the uh, test data to figure out the weights of my machine learning detection algorithm. So I'm using machine learning now for detection. So I'm going to send some set of known input data, which uh, in machine learning parlance is called a one-hot vector. So there's K1 consecutively transmitted symbols. I know what those symbols are, and I observe the output Y. 
And I do this for a bunch of different training sets. So I have here, there's K1 is my first set of training symbols, K2 is my second set. I have some set of symbols. And then um, based on what I receive, so again, the one hot vectors are just telling me which of the different possible training sequences I might have sent. So now I have all my Ys. And I can get the weights based on what the original data sequence was that I was using for my training. So that's um, basically going to give me the weights associated with my neural network. So I'm finding the weights W that give me back what the training data um, uh, that's optimized with respect to the training data. So XK hat, which is the best estimate of what I sent, is based on training up these weights W. This is actually not so different, again, from what we did in, say, equalizer design, where we say, OK, I have a, an equalizer that has some unknown weights associated with it. I'm going to send a tr set of training data into the channel. I go through the equalizer, and I optimize the weights or the taps of the equalizer based on what the known training sequence was. So it's the same idea, except now we're doing it in this machine learning kind of context. So the optimal weights are going to be the weights that minimize some distance measure between the actual training data that I sent, these one hot vectors, which is the machine learning parlance for the training data, and what I actually get out after I've applied these weights. Okay? So again, it's very similar to training and equalization. Through this process, I get the weights W hat. And that's trained up now my detection scheme. So the detection scheme is a neural network. The only unknown in the neural network is the weights. And I've just explained to you how we get the weights. OK? Clear where the weights come from. All right. So now I have my neural network detector. Now there's different ways that you can do machine learning. There's different algorithms for uh, machine learning. The most common is a recurrent neural network. So in a recurrent neural network, again, keep in mind that the Ys are the vectors associated with the uh, kth training sequence. So I'm going to evolve my probabilities associated with the weights for this different training data. And I do it uh, multiple times. That's why it's called a recurrent neural network. And that will give me a set of different um, weights associated with the different symbols that might have been sent. And that gives me the entire uh, 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 probability, you can think about this as the conditional probability, that given that I observe some sequence of vectors, what's the likelihood that a symbol was sent? So again, this looks a lot like maximum likelihood detection. Given that I've observed these different vectors, what's the probability that the symbol that was sent is uh, one of these different M symbols? OK, so the problem with using this traditional recurrent neural network, which is a very common technique for neural network design, is that because we have intersymbol interference, future observations, which are affected by ISI, may affect the value of the current symbol. And that doesn't come into play in the recurrent neural network. So this neural network is only looking at past values for the estimate of the current symbol. It's not looking at future values, which may be affected when you have a channel with memory. So um, another technique that's used in traditional machine learning, so nothing I'm talking about on this slide in terms of bi-directional recurrent neural networks or recurrent neural networks, this is nothing new. This is like bread and butter for machine learning. So I can do the same thing with uh, bi-directional recurrent networks, where I can consider future observations in estimating the current symbol. So now we're getting into the regime of, of um, uh, what we would do with intersymbol interference. OK, so now the current uh, uh, probability that the current vector estimate is equal to a given symbol depends not just on k, but on past as well as future values, which is what you would need in a channel with memory. OK, so the problem with the um, bi-directional recurrent neural networks is that um, because you're saying my current symbol depends on the past as well as the future, the number of blocks I need to take into account in the estimation is a variable length. So I see my first vector, that gives me one estimate. When the next vector comes in, then I take into account both of those in terms of doing my estimates and so forth. So every time I get a new vector, I have to increase the length of the block that I'm looking at to get my estimate of the current symbol. So that's not practical. You can't have a detection algorithm that's variable length, depending on what symbol number you're looking at. That's just impossible to actually implement. 
So this isn't practical from an implementation perspective. The other thing you can do is say, okay, let's take fixed block lengths. So I'll say, okay, I'm going to take the first three together and use those to get an estimate. And then I'll take the next three together and use those to get an estimate. So now I have fixed block length processing, but I'm not taking into account the entire future. So I'm not using the, all the information I have available uh, to do my detection. So both of these are problems with the bi-recurrent, uh, bi-directional recurrent neural networks. So we came up with a new technique. Now again, I will reiterate, I'm not a machine learning person, neither was Nariman. But the fact that we were applying this to a communication problem made us realize that, okay, when we're looking at intersymbol interference, the effect of the ISI dies out over time. And so what we want to do is kind of slide the detector along. And that's been used in other uh, areas of uh, communications. So now we say, okay, suppose we want a fixed block length of three. So I'll take the first three observations and use that to come up with my set of probabilities. When I get the next, so this is my first set of probabilities. When I get the next observation, I'm going to slide the window. So I haven't changed the window size. I haven't changed the length that I'm using for doing the detection. But I'm taking advantage of the fact that I can slide the window to come up with my next set of estimates and so forth. So every time you get a new block, you slide the detector uh, uh, block along to get the new set of probabilities for those, um, those observations, okay? So this was our, our way of coming up with these estimates of the received, uh, of the input that led to the received vector, which is taking into account as much of the past and present as is relevant. So the most relevant past and present, which is the most relevant past and present around the symbol that we're actually looking at without changing the complexity, but using the most up-to-date data. Okay, so how well does this work? You might say, okay, great. You're a communication theorist. You came up with a new machine learning technique. Uh, does it work at all, let alone does it work well? Uh, so there's two ways we did the evaluation. So the first thing that we were asked when we started doing this was, um, well, can this beat a known detection technique, like Viterbi? So we know Viterbi is optimal when we know the channel perfectly. So how well does machine learning do? It can't beat Viterbi because Viterbi is optimal uh, if you know the channel perfectly. So the only way we could evaluate the machine learning against something like Viterbi was to have a channel model because Viterbi needs the input-output symbol distribution or probabilities in order to work. So we started with this molecular communication system. So we said, okay, well, the model for that, it can be approximated by a Poisson channel model. That also works for optimal, optical communication. So we can use the Poisson channel model to model both an optical and a molecular communication channel mathematically, and then we can compare against the optimal Viterbi detector. And even though I say method two, this is where we started, is we started with the molecular communication platform. We built a molecular communication system. It's sitting in my lab. There's no channel model for it because it's just an experimental system. And we said, okay, well, how do, well does machine learning work on that system? So I'll show you that as well, even though we don't have anything that we can compare it against, like the Turby detection, because there's no channel model. Okay, so the Poisson channel model, we're assuming on off keying, um, and that's for, uh, for molecular communication, in fact, this is where Nariman started his work. So for his PhD, uh, Nariman did on-off keying of molecular communication using vodka. Okay, so he had a uh, spray where vodka is a one and no vodka is a zero. Okay, and he had a breathalyzer on the other end uh, to um, measure is there vodka or is there not vodka. Okay, so the problem with that kind of system is if you have a, he did this in Canada, so it's not so dissimilar from Scotland. I guess here it would be scotch instead of vodka, but anyway. So, um, so the problem with that kind of system is that uh, if you get a lot of ones, you get a lot of vodka, and you end up saturating the detector. So there's no, you know, you can't detect a zero because it's full of vodka, kind of like people here on a Saturday night, I guess, would be full of scotch. So, um, but on-off keying is a legitimate way to do the um, molecular communication if you have a more sophisticated detector. So um, the 
in the Poisson channel model, there's lambda t, which is the system response to a pulse corresponding to a one. And so for an you get, depending on whether it's an optical channel or molecular, it's a Poisson model, but you get different um, lambdas. And they also can vary with time, as I'll show on the next slide. Okay, so the optimal detector, so if you want to look at what is the, um, the output given an input for this Poisson model, it's going, to, it's going to be a function of the input and this lambda, which is the channel response, plus some noise. Okay, so this is the model for a Poisson uh, channel. Uh, so, so the noise has some distribution. It's typically not Gaussian. Uh, and so you need to come up with a model for the noise. And, this, and the system response lambda can change over time, and it's also dependent on the environment. So for infrared, this is from uh, my colleague Joe Kahn back when he was at Berkeley, and I was also at Berkeley. He was a professor. I was a student. Now we're both professors. But back in uh, the early or mid-90s, he was doing uh, work on indoor infrared, and he showed that depending on uh, the time of day or whether you were in a diffuse environment or a line of sight, you get very different channel responses, which corresponds to different lambdas. Uh, and the same is true if you're doing uh, ultraviolet light scattering. So the lambda is very much channel dependent. And keep in mind that for the machine learning, I'm not assuming I know lambda. I'm just training uh, on the channel itself. And the Viterbi detector, so again, because you have a channel model, if this is, this is the same equation I had before, so this is the output given the input and the channel response. Uh, for Viterbi, uh, it's a very complex detector. Uh, because you have two to the m states, and that's uh, uh, too many states. It's too complex if you have a channel with long memory. So we actually simplified the Viterbi to use beam search so that only the top n states, the n states with the highest probability, were retained. Um, now, for the machine learning, we have to do training. We're assuming the Viterbi detector knows the channel perfectly, so it knows this lambda of t. For the machine learning, there is no channel model. So we trained it using 300,000 sequences of... Uh, 100 consecutive random bits. Uh, these are just the details of how we did the training, so it's not that important. Um, so what's the, the, the punchline is what's important, okay? So for the optical channel, remember, keep in mind, for the optical channel, we're using the Poisson channel model, so we can compare Viterbi against the machine learning. Uh, now, Viterbi only works well if you have a long memory length, right? If you make the Viterbi memory length too short, it doesn't work very well. Uh, so if we have a long memory length, the blue dash here is the Viterbi detector, and it clearly beats uh, machine learning uh, for those long memory lengths. That's the red one, okay? But, and this is really key, if I don't have perfect channel parameters for Viterbi, so my Viterbi detector is mismatched, those are these two uh, curves. So the green is where I have a 5% error, and the yellow is where I have a 2.5% error in the channel parameters. I do better with machine learning. Okay? So that's true. Here is a function of memory length. Here is a function of symbol duration. And here is a function of the channel noise parameter. And the results are consistent in all three cases that if you don't have perfect channel knowledge, machine learning for beats for turbid detection. Okay? And the bottom curve, which is molecular, this is where, um, again, I'm using a different uh, model for uh, the Poisson as opposed to the optical. Again, you see that machine learning, uh, in this case, is a function of memory length. Machine learning is best except at very high memories. Uh, in this case, uh, if I have fairly uh, long symbol durations, then Viterbi detection always wins, and same as a function of the channel noise here. Uh, so that was the case where I'm using a mathematical model for the channel. Here is our setup for the molecular communication. So how do we get around this vodka problem, the fact that we saturate the detector? Well, we said, okay, let's use two different types of molecules, an acid and a base. So if you have roughly the same number of zeros and ones, then the acids and bases uh, cancel each other out, and therefore you're not going to get this buildup of one type of molecule over another and, and saturate the receiver. So we used uh, acids and bases, uh, uh, water um, for the propagation of those molecules, and then we had a sensor at the other end of the two different types, basically a sensor of the pH. So basically if you're sending a lot of bases, then you'll detect a change in the pH that way, and same if you're sending the acid. So the pH told us whether we were sending an acid or a base, whether we were sending a zero or a one. 
Um, okay, so there's no channel model for this. Again, what you're trying to model is not only the diffusion of the molecules, but the chemical reaction of them together. Because when a base and an acid combine, you have to model that in the channel as well. So we didn't have a channel model for this. Um, the results were that with this um, uh, sliding recurrent neural network, we could drive the probability of error down to zero if we had a long enough symbol time. So again, here's a scenario where our detector beats all of the known detectors for molecular communication. These are not traditional wireless detectors because, again, it's a molecular communication channel, but, um, but our detection technique could drive the probability of error down to zero. So this also tells you that even when you don't have a channel model and you can't apply any traditional technique, you can still get fairly um, low probability of error. Okay, so to summarize machine learning and detection, this uh, proposed detector achieves very good performance with no channel model at all. It can be used for detection in channels with long memories because once you do the training, it's a very fast detection. You don't need to wait for all the complexity of inverting the channel as you would with an equalizer. It doesn't need channel state information, and it can be resilient to changes in the channel condition. So that's something we're working on right now is what happens when the channel, underlying channel is changing. Is the machine learning still robust? How often do you need to train? How should you train? These are all kind of open questions. Um, it also provides soft values, which you can combine with coding, we're also looking at as well. So this is um, uh, there's all this is you know work that's very much in its infancy. There's all kinds of new things that you can think about applying for machine learning and detection. I'm going to take a couple more minutes to talk about the other technique that we looked at of applying machine learning in a communication system, which is joint source and channel coding uh, using deep learning. Okay, so why um, why should we apply machine learning in this case? Why is that interesting? Um, well. So from Shannon theory, Shannon told us uh, that you lose nothing in terms of optimality by designing uh, channel and source codes separately. So compression and channel coding can be designed separately with no loss in optimality. That's true if you're not worried about a complexity constraint or a delay, because Shannon theory is asymptotic, so it assumes infinite delay, infinite complexity. If you do joint source and channel code design, it's actually very hard to do a good design. And I know because I worked on this for about a decade, fairly early in my academic career, and I never got results that I thought were particularly satisfying. So it's a very hard um, uh, area to get fundamental results that improve in terms of joint source and channel coding design versus doing things separately. Um, now, in many applications, instead of trying to recover the data exactly, we're actually interested in recovering some of the information. So the other problem with joint source and channel coding is that it's usually applied to binary data, and you want the probability of error to be zero, because if you're sending data, uh, you can't make a mistake because you basically corrupt the whole file. But if you think about text or voice recognition, if I say, the car is moving or the automobile is moving, it has the same meaning. So from the perspective of the receiver, it's actually the same sentence. You can't capture that when you take those words and convert them to ones and zeros and then convert them back again. But you can capture it in a machine learning type of, uh, of approach, and that's actually why machine learning has been so successful in voice recognition and speech recognition and word recognition, which is what this point is saying. Um, and so deep learning, the successes it's had to date is really uh, because it can extract the most relevant information of interest in terms of classification and so forth. So that was our motivation for looking at this. We focused initially just on joint source and channel coding of text. What we care about is the semantic meaning of the sentences, so we don't care about the exact words, but rather the meaning of what the sentence is trying to convey. So we cluster sentences in that way, or words in that way. Um, and uh, so the advantage of deep learning here is that it can take the semantic structure of language into account, which is why it's been so successful just in text recognition. So nothing about this uh, uh, part of the encoder is uh, different. We're just taking kind of standard encoders for um, encoding text into binary data. The one thing that we do differently here is we take the output of this, so the dense neural network here is what's doing the encoding of the data. We have this binarizer, so this is new, this is what we proposed, which turns the output of the dense network into a binary uh, one or a zero, uh, and, and this is the mapping that we use. And then uh, we design the weights, 
such that the expectation of this uh, binarizer, so the expectation of beta of x, is the same value as the input uh, um, words that we're putting in. Okay, so, so that's the encoder architecture. And then the decoder is, again, kind of a standard uh, uh, neural network decoder, which is trained based on the, the uh, sentences or the word meanings that we're interested in so that we design the weights such that we get the same words out based on the training data. So this is the network. And so the results are interesting. And again, what you see is that we're clustering sentences with similar meaning together as part of the um, classification of the data. So, you know, voted and elected are similar, car and automobile are similar, arriving and coming is similar. So we've clustered sentences that have similar meaning together. Um, and we compared this neural network approach, which is in green, to the most sophisticated separate source and channel coding that we have. So we looked at gzip, Huffman codes, bit5, and then read Solomon codes with uh, fairly powerful error correction coding. And we see that the neural network does better, even at you know, uh, almost all sentence lengths. Okay? So this is really telling us that if you look at an application that machine learning has been very successful at, like classification of words or pictures or so forth, and you use the power of machine learning there plus the communication network, you can actually do better than making everything binary and trying to use our traditional techniques for compression and, um, and channel coding. So this is just the beginning of our work in this joint source and channel coding. The other natural places to apply it are in images and in videos, because again, those are places where machine learning has proved to be very powerful. Okay, so to summarize uh, this part of the talk, uh, we can use deep learning for joint source and channel coding of text data as well as other data where the type of data that machine learning has proven uh, to be very powerful uh, to date. Um, the, the reason it's powerful is because the semantic information in text data can be preserved in uh, neural networks, whereas we can't do that when we convert everything to ones and zeros. So if I take the word automobile and car and I convert them to ones and zeros, they're going to be in very different places in a binary map. Whereas if I do the mapping via a neural network, then I can classify those close together and then if I make a mistake between car and automobile, it has no impact on the semantic meaning. Um, if you have a low bit budget per sentence, it very much outperforms source and channel coding. Obviously, if you have a lot of redundancy, so that when I turn the words into ones and zeros and then I put a heck of a lot of channel coding on it, I'm not going to make any errors because I have a lot of redundancy. So this uh, is very powerful in scenarios where I have very constrained communications um, or complexity. So we're looking at improving the neural networks, uh, using a better measure for accuracy, so better clustering algorithms. But I think the most interesting extensions of this work is to go beyond text to images and video data. So let me uh, wrap up. So uh, again, I think it's a really exciting time to look at uh, next generation wireless systems because we're not just interested in going to higher data rates, which has been what's been driving uh, evolution of wireless design for the last three generations. We're now looking at applications where we have severe communication constraints like the IoT or severe complexity constraints or severe energy constraints. We have devices that are going to be powered by solar or movement. So how do we design new communication systems when we have these constraints? We haven't done that before, so it's kind of a greenfield area of research. I think there's a lot of use, I didn't talk about this at all, but this notion of the software-defined wireless networking. To have software in the cloud that can do dynamic optimization, maybe machine learning could come into play there as well. So if you think about how cellular networks um, do resource allocation, they're basically doing real-time resource allocation. So, you know, at 5 o'clock every night, the same users turn on the same devices, yet our optimization algorithms never take into account what happened yesterday or the day before, or six months before. So there is also a place for machine learning in some of this cloud-based optimization. Uh, there's a lot of interesting communication techniques for small cells, which are actually starting to become very prevalent. Massive MIMO, how do we do millimeter wave communication? So there's a lot of interesting open problems, but I think the punchline of this talk is that machine learning is a powerful tool
in the communication designer's toolbox, but it has to be used with care. We really need to ask the question of, as communication theorists, what do we bring to the table beyond just applying some plain vanilla machine learning algorithm that we pull out of a box and apply to a problem that we're working on? How do we use the knowledge that we have to apply machine learning in a way that will beat the algorithms that we have today, that we've been doing all this research in. And I hope I've given you a couple of examples of that and maybe inspired you to think about that question some more. So thank you very much for your attention.